إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستهدي ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يدلل فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن سيدنا ونبينا وعظيمنا وحبيبنا محمد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أوصي وأوصيكم بتقوى الله قال تعالى أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم تتجافى جنوبهم عن المضاجع يدعون ربهم خوفا وطمعا ومما رزقناهم ينفقون وقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم من كان يؤمن بالله واليوم الآخر فليقول خيرا أو ليصمت أما بعد As Ramadan is approaching us now We must begin to reflect On what it is exactly we are about to engage in And what the benefits of this time are and what is the objective, what are the points, the ethical points, the spiritual points that we need to take advantage of so that when Ramadan leaves, we know the lessons that we need to carry with us. And one of these lessons has been summarized very well in the Hadith of Mu'adh meaning the Sahaba, the great companion of the Prophet ﷺ, Mu'adh ibn Jabal. Now Mu'adh ibn Jabal was one of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, actually the only Sahaba that received a particular praise from the Prophet ﷺ, in that the Prophet ﷺ said that from all of my companions, and remember around the death of the Prophet ﷺ, there were about 12,000 Sahabas, give or take. So that's a huge statement the Prophet ﷺ is making, and he ﷺ is not one to exaggerate. So he says, of all of my companions, the most knowledgeable one in matters of halal and haram is Mu'adh, meaning Mu'adh ibn Jabal. And Umar ibn al-Khattab, after him, after the death of the Prophet ﷺ, would be known for making a famous statement about Mu'adh. And he said that if I had the choice to put someone after me, to recommend someone after me, to lead the affairs of all of the Muslims, it would be Mu'adh ibn Jabal. And he said, and I would stand, and if Allah Ta'ala brought me on Yawm Qiyamah, and he asked me, if Allah asked me, why did you put, why did you recommend Mu'adh to lead the Muslims after you? Look at the perspective of Umar. In his ta'een, in his assignment, his recommendation, he's thinking about the, the consequence. If Allah asked me about why I recommended Mu'adh, I would be prepared to give the following answer. And that is, that I heard the Messenger of Allah Wasallam say, that on Yawm Qiyamah, when all of the ulama, all of the scholars are resurrected, when all of them are resurrected and put in one place, Mu'adh ibn Jabal will be far above them, far in front of them. And the distance between them and Mu'adh will be the distance that a person most skilled can throw a rock. So imagine, for example, the skills of the NFL football players and how far they can throw a football. How many yards? 20, 30, 40, 50 yards, for example. So the Prophet is saying the distance that a person well skilled can throw and cast a stone. And that's the distance 
Mu'adh ibn Jabal will be in front of all of the ulama on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Ka'ad ibn Malik, he would say that Mu'adh ibn Jabal was the most handsome man and had the best akhlaq of his tribe. And one day, Mu'adh ibn Jabal uh, took a loan from some people in Medina. And he was attempting to pay the loan back but wasn't able to pay the entire loan back. And his creditors kept coming to him asking him to, to, to pay back the loan. And Mu'adh couldn't pay it back. He didn't have the money at all to pay back the loan. And his creditors continued to pursue him until so the Prophet ﷺ intervened. And he ﷺ went to the creditors. And he saw that the creditors didn't give up. They still wanted their, this was their right, they wanted their due. They didn't want to give fight, they didn't want to give Mu'adh more time, they didn't want to forgive the loan, they wanted their payment. And then upon hearing that, Mu'adh ibn Jabr radiallahu ta'ala an, he went to his creditors and he signed over his house and all of his belongings in payment of that debt and gave literally everything he had, all of his possessions, his belongings, everything he signed over to the creditors. And he became the first Muslim whose entire property was given to creditors in order to pay a debt. He was the first Muslim that that happened to. And so Mu'adh ibn Jabal learned long before that because in order to get to that point, he took deep lessons from the Prophet ﷺ because the Prophet ﷺ used to train him as a young man. And one of the things that he trained him on was the spirit and the point of basically what's behind Ramadan. He learned that lesson. And so, in the famous tradition narrated by Mu'adh ibn Jabal, he says, I said to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, أَخْبِرْنِي بِعَمَلًا يُدْخِلُنِي الْجَنَّةِ وَيُبَاعِلُنِي عَنِ النَّارِ Tell me about something, tell me about an act that if I do it, I will enter Jannah. Right? And if I stay away from this act, or that act, or a different act, or if I do this act, it will enter me into Jannah. And if I do the same act, it will distance me, not only enter me into Jannah, but distance me from the hellfire. Right? Notice the question and the concern is not just about getting into Jannah, but having no part whatsoever in going to the hellfire. Right? Some people don't care. In the spirit of some other people, they would say, well, you know, I, as long as I know I'm going to paradise, I don't care if I spend some time in the hellfire along the way. And that's the attitude of some people. It's not the attitude of Mu'adh. Give me an advice that I can not only make it the Jannah, but on the way to Jannah, I don't have anything to do with it. Well, you bear me I didn't know. It keeps me, not only do I not go to the hellfire, but I'm far away distant from the hellfire. I don't see anything, I don't see any signs that say detour to Jannah, nothing. Well, you bear me I didn't know. Then the Prophet وسلم, as they were walking, as they used to take walks quite often, he stopped Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he said, لَقَدْ سَأَلْتَ عَنْ حَظِيمٌ You've asked me about a mighty matter. How many questions the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam get from people? How many issues come up? In this one question, he tells Mu'adh, you've asked a question about a mighty affair. You've asked a most profound question. وَإِنَّهُ لَيَسِيرٌ عَلَى مَنْ يَسَّرَهُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى عَلَيْهِ But this matter, although it's heavy, although it's mighty, Allah Ta'ala can make it easy for the one that He chooses to make it easy for. It's a mighty affair, but it can be made easy. Don't be fearful. تَعْبُدَ اللَّهَ لَا تُشْرِكُ بِهِ شَيْئًا The first thing He said is worship Allah with no partners. وَتُقِيمُ الصَّلَاةِ He said. And then establish the prayer, not just pray. Establish the prayer. وَتُعْتِيَ zakat And pay your zakat. وَتَصْهُمُ Ramadan, He said. And fast in the month of Ramadan. وَتُحِجُّ الْبَيْتِ And make your hajj. Make your pilgrimage to the house 
Allah. So he gives him the five fundamental basics. Remember, no matter how sophisticated you are, right, no matter how tricky you want to get, you want to go to Jannah, but you want a shortcut, there's always the fundamentals. There's always the basics. The basics never change. They are the same for everyone. And so the Prophet ﷺ reminded him of those basics, those fundamental principles. And then he said, أَلَا أَدُلُّكَ عَلَىٰ أَبْوَابٍ خَيْرٍ After that he said, Do you want me to tell you? Do you want me to point the way to you? To doors that will lead you to khair, that will lead you to righteousness and virtue. He said, أَسَّوْمُ جُنَّةٍ Fasting, fasting, of all of these things, the fast becomes a protective guard for you. Right. It's like when the soldier, in the old days, the knight, wants to go out to battle, he puts on his armor, puts on his protective guard. Why? Because in the midst of the war, in the midst of, the, of, of battle, you can inevitably get struck. Now, there are no real enemies out there that are pointing uh, arrows or bullets at us, but there are spiritual enemies that look to assail us at every moment. We are vulnerable to certain types of attack from enemies that we have yet to perceive or we constantly forget. One of the most common ones are the West West from Shaytan. And so the Prophet ﷺ, in the spirit of someone who knows battle, because Mu'adh was involved in many campaigns, used the most perfect analogy that before battle you prepare. You put on your armament, you put on your garments that are going to protect you. And so he says, should I not tell you or show you the way to khair, the, the way to goodness, the doors that when you enter these doors, you're walking in khair, and khair in the, in the other terminology, in our Islamic terminology, means bir, righteousness. And also even deeper in our Islamic terminology, it means the actions that if you do it, when you do it, for the right reason, you earn the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So shall I not show you the path that leads to those things? He said, as fasting. It is a garment for you, a shield for you. And so we are entering the month where every day we're going to be putting on our garments. Every day we're going to be shielding ourselves. It is a month where the Muslims as a community enter into an intensive moment where we are most vigilant and most aware and most on guard to those spiritual enemies and those spiritual harms that are waiting to assail us despite and ironically Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala locks up the shaitan which is really an irony that there is a month where you are taught to protect yourself and your enemy is locked up but the idea is to go to training camp the idea is to prepare because when the enemy attacks, when shaitan is let loose, he's going to attack with a mighty vengeance. So the Prophet ﷺ says, as Jannah." This fasting business, this idea of siyam, of fasting, which is a protection. And then he said, وَالصَّدَقَةُ تُطْفِئُ الْخَطِئَةِ كَمَا يُطْفِئُ الْمَاءُ النَّارِ and charity after that extinguishes and puts out your bad deeds just like water extinguishes flames and fire. And this is the month of charity as well. It's the month of literally, like, metaphorically, abstractly putting out fires. The fires of the nefs that burn. The fires of greed the fires of self-consumption, the fires of stinginess, the fires of too much spending, the fires of waste, those fires that lead to sin, 
Because every fire leaves behind it ashes and trace of the fire. And so the Prophet ﷺ said, the spending, which becomes easy, by the way, as a result of the fasting, as you're already giving up, you're already restraining and withholding, so it's easy to give, it extinguishes your sins. And the point of that is that the accumulation, the building up of sins, is what weighs us down and causes worship to be a burden for us. This is why it's hard to get up at night. This is why it's hard to stay up at night. You're getting up to stay up to pray Aisha. This is why it's hard to go to the masjid sometimes. This is why it's tough to pray with more concentration than you usually have. It's tough. It's like somebody has literally attached weights to our arms that we are when we when we lift our hands up to say Allahu Akbar, it's like ten pounds is attached to our wrists. It's tough. We want to go into rukur. It's like pulling weights to lift down like we're at the gym. And the only rest we have is when we're in sajda, as if we've just fallen on a bed. What is it? There's no weights on us. What is it that weighs us down, that makes it tough? It is sins. That's where it comes from, those sins. So what eliminates those weights? It's the sadaqah. It's the charity. It's the giving, the act of giving. And so it extinguishes those weights just like fire, or just like water puts out fire. Now we come to the serious part, the prayer of a person in the middle of the night. The month of Ramadan encompasses all of these. The fasting, the sadaqah, the prayer at night. And then the Prophet ﷺ, he recited to Mu'adh a verse from the Qur'an in Surah Al-Sajdah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains sometimes the Prophet ﷺ, his job is to explain the Qur'an. But in this point, when the Prophet ﷺ was advising Mu'adh, on this point, the Prophet ﷺ used the Qur'an to explain his point. Very, very unique. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, تَتَجَافَ جُنُوبُهُمْ عَنِ الْمَضَاجِعِ That talking about a certain class of people, that their backs become dry. Right. You know, when you sleep, it's particularly those of you that have ever lived in, well, we're in Texas, but in warm climates, without air conditioning, let's put it like that. You sweat at night, we all sweat at night. And so the notion of a dry back is not a common notion to somebody who sleeps in the Arabian Peninsula without air conditioning at night. It may be cool at night and sometimes it's very cool. But generally in the heat at night, when you sleep, on your back, you sweat. It's common. And so Allah Ta'ala is saying that these individuals, their back is dry. Why? Because they separate it from the bed they, in, instead of proximity to the bed, which causes sweat to emerge because of the heat of the back being pressed, being so close to the bed, these people prefer a different type of proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they prefer to extinguish the heat, the heat of sins. They prefer a different type of closeness. And so their back is dry. Tatajafa. Their dry junubuhum, their backs and their sides. Some people sleep on their backs, some on their sides. Anil madaji, it's dry from the from the bed. From being anil madaji, from the bed. Why ya rab yadiruna rabbuhum? Because they are making dua. Other people are asleep. They're making dua at night. Khawfan wa tama'an. 
Their dua combines two things. Fear and hope. Fear uh, of the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if they neglect that moment. Not just fear of Allah, but fear of losing the moment. Fear of not taking advantage of the moment. Fear of not grabbing hold of the moment. And tama'an, hope for what that moment, catching that moment, grabbing that moment, taking advantage of that moment, having hope that that is what will get them into Jannah. وَمِمَّا رَزَقُنَاهُمْ يُنْفِقُونَ And they spend from the wealth that we give them, or that they are given. The notion of spending of sadaqah is there. So the Prophet ﷺ quoted that verse. That their backs are dry because they, because they separate from the bed, and they spend their time entreating Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, using hope and fear. Accessing the moment. And they spend a portion of what they are given. فَلَا تَعْلَمُ نَفْسٌ مَا أُخْفِيَ لَهُمْ No nafs, Allah ta'ala says, continuing the Prophet's quoting, وسلم, no nafs knows what is stored up for them. Min qurrata a'in. No nafs, no soul, knows the beautiful things that their eyes will see that is stored. They don't know the reward that's that's stored up for them. Nobody knows what's 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 stored up for them. Jazaun bima can we amalu as a reward because of what they used to do. That standing that, you, that they used to do. That spending that they used to do. The taking advantage of that moment that they used to do. So the Prophet ﷺ quoted those ayahs, those two ayahs, in Surah to sajda to Mu'adh. This is what it's about. And then he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, أَلَا أُخْبِرُكَ بِرَأْسِ الْأَمْنِ O Mu'adh, do you want me to tell you what the main purpose of this is? Or Ra's al Amrit, the most important aspect of this is. Wa Amudi, and do you want me to tell you what holds up, what props up this situation, this 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 ordeal? Do you want me to tell you what the head of the situation is? And then do you want me to tell you what the pillars are that hold up the head? And then you want me to tell you the things that keep it going, the engine that moves it. I'm using a metaphor here. Do you want me to tell you? You've asked me to tell you, give you a, a task, give you something that will get you into Jannah and keep you away from Nar. In this answer, I'll tell you what the head of the thing is, I'll tell you what props it up, and then I'll tell you what keeps it going. And he said, Bala, Ya Rasulullah, of course, Ya Rasulullah. He said, Ra'sul Amr Islam. The head of the whole situation that gets you into Jannah, keeps you away from Nar, is Islam. Foundation. That's why he started with the five pillars. And then he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Wa Amudu Salat, and the prayer is the pillars that keeps it going. This is why we spend Ramadan and Taraweeh all the time. Enforcing our pillars, enhancing our pillars, propping up our Islam. وَذِرْوَةِ السِّنَانِ الْجِهَادِ And the engine that keeps this thing going is struggle. Jihad, struggle. Now they're on their way, they're walking, they're on the military exposition, they've got their garments on, they've got their armor on, and so the Prophet ﷺ knows that when he utters that term jihad and struggle, there's a conception in the mind of the youth who's on his way to battle already. That the engine that drives this thing is the military battle, is the assumption. But our teacher, sallallahu alayhi wa will turn his attention to something deeper. And then he says, أَلَا أُخْبِرُكِ بِمِلَاكِ ذَلِكَ كُلِّكِ Shall I tell you 
what the purpose and the core of this is, the real essence of it is. He said, Bala ya Rasulullah. What's the real purpose of Islam? What's the real purpose of the Salat and the struggle and everything of that nature? Everything, the real purpose, the real essence of trying to get into Jannah and out of Jannah and all, all of the Salawat and everything, the spending, the real core element, the thing that it boils down to the bottom line, as they say. Ana ya Rasulullah, of course. What's the bottom line, ya Rasulullah? We're going for military struggle. What's the bottom line? Why, why are we doing this? What's the struggle about? And then the Prophet ﷺ stopped. And he ﷺ took hold of his own tongue. And in another narration, he took hold of Mu'adh's tongue. He opened his mouth and grabbed his tongue. In another narration, he grabbed his own tongue. ﷺ. فَأَخَذَ بِلِسَانِهِ أَيْ بِلِسَانِ النَّبِي صلى الله عليه وسلم أو بِلِسَانِ مُعَاذ Both interpretations are valid. He took hold of his own tongue or he took hold of the tongue of his, the lad, youth, Mu'adh. He said, صلى الله عليه وسلم, this. Control this. This is what the fasting is about. Control this. This instrument here. This is not the blade that's on your side has the ability to cut, has the ability to kill, yes. But this here between your lips, it also has the ability to cut. It also has the ability to tear. It also has the ability to kill. It has the same function. The difference is with one you see blood, with the other you see tears. It has the same function. Mu'adh, you shocked. Ya Rasulullah, will we be held accountable for what we say? وَإِنَّنَا مُؤَاخِذُونَ بِمَا نَتَكَلَّمُ بِهِ Will we be taken, literally taken, مُؤَاخِذُونَ بِمَا نَتَكَلَّمُ بِهِ by what we talk with, he said. Literally, will we be taken to account by what we talk with? Which is very profound. This young kid didn't say, Will we be held accountable by talking? He said, Will we be held accountable by what we speak with? That means if you slander somebody with the computer, you're still accountable. If you slander somebody with sign language, you're still accountable by what you talk with. Whether you talk with your hands, or you talk with an iPad. When you talk with your eyes, Woe to every person who backbites and slanders and talks with the eyes. Ya Rasulullah, will we be taken to account by what we speak with? By the instrument of communication. Will we be taken on account of that instrument? And the Prophet ﷺ, he said, ya Mu'adh. Your mother would be weeping for you. It's as if you died. In other words, you should be ashamed of yourself for the question. You go to the ultimate graduate program. Of course, you'll be taken to account by the instrument that you use to communicate with. And he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he closed and ended the lesson by saying, Ya Mu'adh, O oh Mu'adh, is there anything more that throws people on their faces in the hellfire than the consequences of their communication? Is there anything more? وَهَلْ يَكُبُّ النَّاسِ فِي النَّارِ عَلَى وُجُوهِهِمْ Is there anything else that causes people to be face down in the hellfire. إِلَّا حَصَائِدُ أَلْسِنَتَهُمْ Except the consequences of their communication. Right. Ulama have said several things about this, but in the interest of time, we'll conclude with one point, inshallah ta'ala. This, what we take from this, one of the lessons we take in conclusion, 
is that one of the benefits, one of the main benefits of this Mubarak month of Ramadan is to change and radically alter the communication habits of the Muslims. The idea of fasting is one where our appetites are controlled and at the external level our breath physically changes which makes constant communication intolerable anyway. But the deeper lesson that is born throughout the Taraweeh, that is born throughout the constant uh, act of recita- reciting the Qur'an and reading the Qur'an, that is born out through the collective action of charity and zakat and sadaqah, that is born out through the constant act, the collective act of standing up in the night for qiyam, that all of that through this month teaches us in an intensive way that the priority is establishing constant and ongoing communication with our Rabb. That the communication that we have to establish must be through the lens of the Qur'an and through the blueprint of the Qur'an and the text of the Qur'an. That our actions must be informed through communicating with the Qur'an, reading the Qur'an, hearing the Qur'an, following the Qur'an, consulting the Qur'an, living the Qur'an. Everything should be Qur'anic about our communication with Allah and therefore our communications and our dealings with each other. We at the human level get so wrapped up in talking so much that we forget the merit of acting just as much. And so this is a month that's coming up of action. It is a month where the talking, the literal tongue, the tongue as an instrument recedes and retires and is used in a different way for adhkar, for kiraat, for dua. And that in itself should reform our communicative habits with each other and should inspire us for new change. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow these meanings and other deeper meanings to permeate our minds and our hearts and our arwah, our souls. Bi rahmatika ya rahman rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Usiyya wa usiyikum bi taqwa Allah Qala ta'ala Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala al-nabi Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad Wa ala alihi Sayyidina Muhammad Kaman salaita ala Sayyidina Ibrahim Wa ala alihi Sayyidina Ibrahim وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى ال سيدنا محمد كما باركت على سيدنا ابراهيم وعلى ال سيدنا ابراهيم انك حميد مجيد اللهم اهدنا في من هديت وافنا في من عافيت وتولنا في من توليت وبارك لنا في ما اعطيت وقنا شر ما قضيت انك تقضي ولا يقضى عليك انه لا يذل من واليت ولا يعز من عاديت تبارك ربنا وتعالى فلك الحمد على ما قضيت نستغفرك ونتوب اليك نستغفرك ونتوب اليك نستغفرك ونتوب إليك وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم عباد الله اتقوا الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يا إذكم لعلكم تذكرون أقم الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar Ashadu an la ilaha illallah Ashadu an la ilaha illallah Ashadu anna Muhammad rasulullah Ashadu anna Muhammad rasulullah Hayya ala salah, hayya ala salah Hayya ala al-falah, hayya ala al-falah Kat kamati salah, kat kamati salah Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله محمد رسول الله استوصفوا فيكم heels on the line please shoulder to shoulder no gaps no spaces 
tied the ranks. <coughs> Allahu Akbar. الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين قد أفلح المؤمنون الذين هم في صلاتهم خاشعون والذين هم عن اللغو معرضون والذين هم للزكاة فاعلون والذين هم لفروجهم حافظون إلا على أزواجهم أو ما ملكت أيمانهم فإنهم غير ملومين فمن ابتغى وراء ذلك فأولئك هم العادون والذين هم لأماناتهم وعهدهم راعون والذين هم على صلواتهم يحافظون أولئك هم الوارثون الذين يرثون الفردوس هم فيها خالدون الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين ويل لكل همزة لمزة الذي جمع مالا وعدده يحسب أن ما له أخلده كلا لينبذن في الحطمة وما أذراك ما الحطمة نار الله الموقدة التي تطلع على الأفئدة إنها عليهم مؤصدة في عمد ممددة الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر
السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله Assalamu alaikum. Brothers and sisters, few announcement. Tonight, after Maghrib, we have a visiting scholar from Oklahoma. Sheikh Abdul Rahman Basir will be conducting a halakha after Maghrib. He will also be giving a short lecture after Fajr tomorrow morning. And after his short lecture, we'll have a community breakfast for both brothers and sisters. Your volunteers will be cooking breakfast. We'd like you to come and uh, enjoy the breakfast with us tomorrow morning. Also tomorrow, between Asr and Maghrib, Sheikh Abu Mahir, he will be conducting a lecture here in the prayer hall.